Okay, I am Dr. Weiss, and I'm going to be presenting a PowerPoint on the 17th century colonialism and Afrobens Orinoco. Uh, this is uh, a long presentation, and I'm breaking this up into several parts. Uh, there'll be a break after part one, and I think I'm going to include parts two and three all together in the same video. This is a uh, very exciting, I think, um, exciting I think is the word, uh, moment in history, the 17th century. Uh, this is going to set up the context for us to understand Afrobens Orinoco. But to understand the context in the 17th century, we have to start a little bit earlier with one of the uh, most important or most impactful moments in human history back in the 15th century. So this is all going to lead to the historical context from which we can understand a little bit more of what's going on in Afrobens Orinoco. So this is a period of uh, the history of exploration. Uh, this is uh, the 15th century is going to be, 15th and 16th century going, uh, is going to be the beginning of the age of empire. We are going to discuss Afroben as a woman writer and as perhaps the first novelist. And uh, uh, scholars have been thinking about Afrobens Orinoco and thinking about uh, Afroben as uh, a female author here. And the third part of this presentation is I'm going to have some introductory remarks about Orinoco, how we can think about the text in two different uh, parts, uh, and some different things happen in the first part of the novel and in the second part of the novel. And I'm going to refer to Orinoco as a novel, although, as I said, that's up for debate. And uh, then I'm going to have some points, some pre-reading points that I want us to pay attention to as we go through the novel. So the age of exploration, why the 15th century? So first of all, when I say the 15th century, I'm talking about uh, the 1400s, and this is going to lead to uh, Christopher Columbus. But what was it about the 15th century that people from Europe, that explorers, that conquistadors, um, uh, moved from the European continent out into what we'll call the New World, but we're going to say, if I say the Old World and the New World, we're going to have to put quotations around those terms uh, because we're going to talk and qualify those uh, a little bit later. What was it about the 15th century, this sort of perfect storm of politics and economics and technology that allowed people from, uh, from uh, Europe to go to the New World, to the Western Hemisphere? Uh, several things. Uh, Latin sail. So we're going to talk first about technology. What is a Latin sail? Well, if you are going to travel in one direction when you are sailing and you have the wind with you, then it makes for a, a, a voyage that uh, has movement, that you are going somewhere. Um, these very large square sails, however, uh, before the 15th century, um, made it very difficult, if not impossible, to tact into the wind. So if the wind was coming at you, how could you travel? So if you were going on a long voyage, maybe you could get there, but you couldn't get back. So a Latin sail was a development in the 15th century, probably came out of the Muslim world, um, and this allowed ships to tack into the wind so you could travel both with the wind and against the wind. A stern post rudder, um, you know, essentially before a rudder was an oar that was stuck uh, in the water that helped guide the ship. A stern post rudder was uh, much stronger and it was much deeper and uh, able to help the ship navigate in deep waters. The astrolabe or the quadrant, uh, the, astro the astrolabe or the astrolabe is a very interesting technological invention. Probably had been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. Probably developed in its very earliest form during the Greek Empire. Uh, it was modernized during the 15th century. What did an astrolabe do? Uh, the astrolabe was the, the iPhone of the 15th century. It allowed sailors to identify celestial bodies. Uh, it allowed sailors, depending on the, the type of astrolabe that was uh, produced, it allowed to see regional latitude. Uh, it allowed to measure the distance uh, of celestial bodies on the horizon. Uh, and different astrolabes were, were produced for different sorts of things uh, as timepieces to help tell when it might be time to pray and other sorts of things. Having an astrolabe allowed sailors to navigate uh, large bodies of water like the Atlantic Ocean. 
And then, of course, the cannon. And the sort of anecdotal story of the cannon was that fireworks were invented by the Chinese several hundred years prior. And um, what did Europeans do? Well, they took uh, a bell and stuffed in fireworks uh, into a bell, an, uh, an upturned bell, and they put a projectile in it and lit it, and now you had a cannon. So you had uh, a kind of ordinance that could be used uh, for defense or for uh, offensive purposes. So technology in the 15th century, all of these things came together that allowed people to navigate and sail long distances. What else? An economic system. Uh, the 15th century was developing or uh, was moving out of a feudal system. So you have a growing middle and merchant class. You had <clears throat> people that were investing in long voyages that became, uh, people became kind of like, uh, you know, own stock in, uh, own stock in terms of investing into these longer voyages, and so they had a vested interest uh, in their success. There was a desire, a will to explore, and we're going to talk about this uh, in some more detail here shortly. In politics, there was a consolidation of nation states. Uh, sort of the, the modern understanding of countries that we have today, like Portugal and France and Italy, uh, centralized government and boundaries and, and so forth. Uh, in the 15th century, this became modernized, and so this was also one of the important ingredients that facilitated the, uh, the age of exploration. Some scholars have suggested that Christopher Columbus sailing from the European continent into, quote, unquote, the New World was the single most important moment in human history. Uh, and, and that, I think, is a, is a pretty large statement to say, a single particular moment being the largest moment in human history. Christopher Columbus was probably born in Genoa, although there is uh, some debate, uh, not uh, a lot of evidence to suggest that Christopher Columbus, um, there's a, a theory that he might have been Jewish. Uh, a theory that he was born in uh, Poland is another uh, theory. These, these theories don't have uh, a lot of evidence to support them, but probably born in Genoa. And uh, so uh, uh, an Italian explorer and was interested in finding uh, a, a kingdom, interested in finding a country, if you will, that was uh, interested in financing a voyage uh, overseas. His grand dream was to reach Asia by sailing westward across the Atlantic. He led his four voyages to the Americas from 1492 to 1504 and opened the Western Hemisphere to European exploration and colonization. It was, again, in the sort of perfect storm of things that occurred, uh, Part fate, part destiny, uh, part luck, part tenacity, ingenuity that allowed Christopher Columbus to successfully make his voyage uh, into the Caribbean, where, which, is, uh, uh, which is where he first landed. He had very good weather, and this again was sort of luck on his part. He made an important egregious error, however, which worked against him, and obviously it worked out well for him at the end. He had estimated the distance of a degree as to be about 1,900 miles, uh, when in fact it was much more. So what Christopher Columbus did was he kept two journals, a journal that he might have shared with his shipmates to tell them that they were getting closer to where, uh, you know, where he wanted to go, and then an actual journal of the distance that he was traveling. So he thought that he was going to be able to make this journey in a lot less time, but because of his calculation error, uh, he, uh, the journey took a lot longer. Christopher Columbus is a controversial figure, and we'll, we'll talk about why that is. And, and we hear this every year during uh, Columbus Day, and banks are closed, and, and other places are closed, and I'm not really certain that it's uh, celebrated. I don't hear about celebrations per se. Uh, Christopher Columbus brought European culture into the Western Hemisphere. But the other part of the story, and this is where you hear protests and, and maybe rethinking history, 
is that the sort of consequences of Europeans coming to, uh, to the Caribbean, to South America, to North America, to Central America, uh, as we'll see here shortly, uh, was quite severe. So here's a map of some various uh, voyages, and uh, some of these names uh, might sound familiar. Uh, Cartier and, and Ponce de Leon, and, and uh, we have Christopher Columbus, and uh, America of Vespucci. Uh, actually, one of my, uh, I guess, favorite conquistadors or explorers, at least the story of it is interesting, is uh, Elvar Nunez Cabaza de Vaca, uh, who in the early uh, 16th century uh, led an expedition up into uh, the Tampa Bay area in Florida. He started with uh, about 300 men, about four ships, uh, they encountered bad weather, they encountered uh, First Peoples uh, in the Tampa Bay, today the Tampa Bay region, and uh, there were about eight survivors after a short period of time. Cabaza de Vaca worked his way through the northern part of Florida, through the southern part of what's now the United States, through Texas, and down into Mexico. He traveled about 4,500 miles over uh, a series of uh, more than a half dozen years. And the sort of idea of going native, and uh, Cabaza de Vaca has journals which are very interesting to read. At times, uh, he was a slave. At times, uh, from various peoples that he encountered, at times he was considered a god. He learned uh, parts of different languages. Uh, he adopted uh, uh, clothing uh, during some parts of his voyage when he was a slave. At times, he was forced to go naked. Uh, so this idea that uh, a Spaniard had to go native uh, in the New World. This is outlined uh, in his journal. What or whom did the Europeans encounter? And, uh, you know, when we think about the first peoples, when we think about the native peoples that uh, were already living uh, in the Western Hemisphere uh, when the Europeans came, we think of the three sort of major empires. In Mexico, we have, we have the Aztecians. In uh, Central America, in the lowlands, we have the Mayans. And in uh, Peru, we have the Incas in South America. These were thriving cultures. They had their own religious systems. They had, um, in, uh, some of these cultures had their own writing systems. They were interested in mathematics and astronomy. They had their own economic and political systems. These were, these were cultures that were every bit as developed as European cultures. Now this is not what the Europeans thought. The Europeans saw scantily clad uh, native peoples. They thought that they were backward. Uh, not all of these cultures uh, engaged in literacy. So the Europeans looked at these people as primitive, and so that was a kind of justification for uh, their actions that took place subsequently, which we are going to talk about. What I also want to contextualize, and, and, and the Aztecians, the Mayans, and uh, the Incas, again, are the three sort of major uh, major cultures that we think about in the 14th and 15th centuries. And about this period of time, to sort of contextualize, these are other cultures that existed in North America. Now, are these cultures as, as sexy, as interesting? Yes and no. Interesting, yes. But these cultures that existed in, uh, in North America um, have different sorts of runes that, uh, that, uh, that one can visit, that, uh, that one can see. Uh, Montezuma's Castle in Arizona. These, uh, many of these cultures had uh, thousands of people, uh, tens of thousands, uh, even Poverty Point, Louisiana, which in, the name is problematic because it was not, of course, originally named Poverty Point. Uh, this was uh, a people a native people that lived in Louisiana. There were maybe up to uh, more than 10,000 people that lived uh, in this culture at this location. Poverty Point was the name given to it uh, because of slave culture in the 19th century. But these are the Chaco Canyon culture in New Mexico, a place that I many years ago had the opportunity uh, to visit. It's uh, uh, cliff dwellings and uh, akibas and, and all sorts of different things. But these were also uh, cultures that were uh, existing at the time 
of uh, European conquest, more or less, and uh, other peoples throughout uh, North America. There were, and estimates are, maybe millions of people living in North America at the time of European conquest. That was soon to change. So these were the Incas, uh, the Mayans, and the Aztecians, uh, highly developed political, religious, cultural, and technological societies. The Aztecs were versed in various forms of medicine, uh, were interested in universal education, had a calendar, produced gum and chocolate, two things that the Europeans were very much interested. Mayans, they had ball courts, interested in astronomy, uh, created observatories, had a calendar, interested in mathematics, the symbol of zero. Uh, zero's, uh, a, 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 a zero has an interesting history. Zero has been around for maybe thousands of years, but uh, oftentimes zero as a value uh, was not really developed um, until much later. Uh, hundreds if not thousands of years ago, the zero was a kind of placeholder between other numbers that had value. Uh, for, uh, for the uh, Mayans, zero had a value and was part of mathematical calculation. Uh, glyph language, rubber, art, architecture, uh, they used obsidian and terracine uh, as a form of agricultural production. Uh, Incas, 25,000 mile highway. Uh, the Incas, the seat of the Incan Empire, Machu Picchu, uh, which was not near the coast. So uh, agricultural production, which might have taken place in the lower lands, had to get up to uh, 8,000, 9,000 feet above sea level. Most of the Incan civilization existed above 8,000 feet above sea level, which is really quite amazing when they really had no beasts of burden. We're going to talk about animals here uh, shortly. Um, the Incas had maybe the alpaca or the llama, uh, which is a different kind of beast of burden, uh, not like uh, uh, musk ox or, or other uh, oxen or, or donkeys or, or whatnot. So the Incas, 25,000 mile highway, they had a communication system, terracing, forms of accounting, freeze drying, uh, performed some form of brain surgery, um, and were interested in developing medicine. So the history of agricultural production also is important in understanding the context of Incan, Mayan, and Aztecian civilization, as well as uh, First People civilizations in North America. Between 6,000 and 10,000 years ago, a Native Americans living in what is now Mexico began domesticating teosinte. Teosinte was a kind of grain, and it had about uh, a dozen kernels on it. And through 10,000 years, through thousands of years, this uh, kernel-like grass was developed into corn, which obviously has uh, hundreds of kernels. Uh, this is, uh, Teosinte means the grain of the gods. Cannot yet say how long this domestication process took. Maybe around 4,500 years ago, a plant recognizable as today's corn was present across the Americas. Where was corn important? Where was it a staple of civilization? In, uh, in northern Mexico, in, uh, well, really in, in Mexico and in North America. In South America, they had a different product that was the staple of uh, their agricultural production and really a staple of civilization if the staple of civilization is trying to feed your community, trying to feed um, uh, your people. And this is the potato. The potato is a quote, unquote, old world food. It was not known in, uh, in Europe. The Incas produced uh, maybe a thousand different varieties of potato, some of them even uh, poisonous. In the uh, image over my right shoulder, uh, I believe it is an image of Machu Picchu. Um, actually, one of my uh, sons had an opportunity a few months ago, uh, right before uh, quarantine. He was, in, uh, he was in Peru, and luckily he was able to leave. Uh, he went to Machu Picchu, and uh, outside of his uh, altitude sickness, 
uh, he sent pictures back of Machu Picchu, one that looks exactly like this sort of quintessential image of uh, Machu Picchu, uh, high up uh, in the mountains and really quite spectacular from the pictures that I saw and from our communication uh, of how a civilization could live and thrive at these elevations. Uh, the image in the lower left-hand corner is of uh, a woman uh, in Peru, and she's uh, stomping on uh, the potatoes, uh, and it's part of the process of preserving them uh, to dehydrate them to get all of the uh, moisture out of the potato so they can be preserved. The potato plays an incredibly important role, not only in uh, Incan history, but also in Irish history. And we'll get to that um, in just a moment. So what was it that the Europeans were interested in? The Portuguese, and these are sort of broad generalizations, the Portuguese, who were some of the first Europeans to come to South America, set up trading posts and at least in the beginning were interested in a, a kind of equitable trade. That was to change a little bit later on, and by the time the Spanish came, very shortly after, uh, that was going to change significantly. Uh, the Europeans brought a variety of things with them, including war. Europeans, conquistadors, explorers were interested in wealth. They were interested in the commodification of natural resources. Um, they were interested in sugar. We're going to talk about sugar. We're going to talk about uh, religion. The three G's, gospel, guns, and gold. These were things that uh, European uh, imperialists, European conquistadors were interested in. So <clears throat> why was it, you know, I said a, a few moments ago, a little bit early, uh, earlier on, that this was the most, some scholars suggest, that this was the most impactful moment in human history. Again, quite, quite a large statement uh, that some scholars have made. Well, because of the consequences of the interaction between Europeans in the late 15th and 16th century and with the first peoples or native peoples uh, in the Caribbean, in South America, and a little bit later in North America. Estimates place between 85 and 90 percent of all indigenous peoples in the Americas are dead within 50 years. Does this make it easy for European conquest? Sure, if you are uh, advancing uh, within a region, uh, you could just sort of wait it out. Where did all of these people go? So estimates range from 40 million to 85 million uh, people uh, in the quote-unquote new world uh, are dead. Some estimates I've seen are even higher than that. Why did they die? War? Sure, that played a role. Genocide? Absolutely, that played a role. Disease, bubonic plague, smallpox, influenza, the flu, chickenpox, measles, typhus, tuberculosis. Why? How did this happen? In 2020, this now I think a uh, makes a little bit more sense to us in 2020 with coronavirus, with our quarantine, with uh, the new world that uh, is trans or the world that is transforming into something different now. Scholars think that, well, scholars know that there were no, that there were, that there were a variety of animals that did not exist uh, in North America, that did not live in North America, that did not live in Central America or South America. What were these animals? These were beasts of burden. These were goats. These were cows. Um, these were other beasts of burden uh, that did not exist here. Um, the horse did not exist uh, in the Western Hemisphere. There used to be a horse. There was an American horse, an indigenous uh, American horse, and, and that American horse died out at the end of the late Pleistocene, about 8,000 to 10,000 years, um, roughly, before present BP. So all of these animals were not here. The horse wasn't here. Cows weren't here. Goats, 
sheep. None of these animals were here. What does this have to do with disease? Well, again, today, this may make a little bit more sense. We talk about zoonoptic diseases. We talk about diseases that move from, let's say, well, at least right now they're, they're thinking this may change, that coronavirus has moved from bats to people. Well, these other diseases, like chickenpox or smallpox or the flu, may have been diseases that domesticated animals had, and they migrated before Europeans, well before Europeans came to the Western Hemisphere, that they had migrated to European and Asian populations. After a period of time, there's a kind of herd immunity, or uh, a sort of uh, e uh, equitability in terms of, of people surviving and, uh, uh, and getting these various diseases. When Europeans came to the Western Hemisphere, when they met the first peoples that were here, the native peoples that were here, they had never been introduced to these diseases because they didn't have these animals with them. And because they had no immunity, they died in massive numbers. Okay, okay this will be the end of part one. Thank you.